Let me start this video with a true story. So a large company was having trouble keeping secrets. Something important would get discussed in a meeting and by the end of the day it was as if the entire organization knew about what was going on. As one might have expected, the company started encrypting documents, gave every employee a code for accessing flows and printers, they used artificial intelligence to monitor emails, they even randomly listened to phone calls but to no avail. They just couldn't figure out the source of these leaks. Out of sheer desperation, the company employed an anthropologist to see if she could solve this puzzle. Now conceptually, anthropology is the study of what makes us human and anthropologists take a broad view of the world to understand the different aspects of human experience, including our biology, our habits, cultures, and particular to this case, how people interact in social relationships. You see, what came out after a few weeks of the study is that the organization had changed its smoking policy. And instead of having many designated smoking areas around the building, the company had opted for a single area within the campus where employees could smoke. This essentially led to people across departments who normally would not have spoken to each other to interact over cigarettes, which soon became the source of organizational leaks. Now, the reason I share this story is because what the organization could not solve using surveillance equipments or traditional preventive policies was actually resolved with a small dose of anthropology. If you look deeper, it's very common to see fields being studied individually like economics, sciences, psychology, etc. But in the real world, there are many common denominators across topics. In my opinion, this is all the more important investing, which borrows approaches and thought models from different disciplines. And the world's best investors are the ones who are adept at connecting the dots. And so in this video, we learn a bit more on this and continually refer back to this post on how the world works, which was published in Morgan Housel's excellent blog, The Collaborative Fund. Let's begin. The Muller's ratchet was named after Hermann Joseph Muller and is a process which results in an accumulation of irreversible deleterious mutations in the absence of recombination. Okay, this might sound a bit complicated, so let's simplify this a bit. What the theory says is that the evolution of any species is severely hampered in the absence of variety. So for instance, if the same genetics of the parent is exactly passed on to the offspring, which is then passed to their offspring, then there is no genetic recombination here, and this can lead to dangerous mutations ultimately leading to extinction. When we apply this to the modern day commerce, the Muller's ratchet is exactly what happens in close societies and large corporations. There is resistance to change, there are no new ideas, bad habits tend to stick, there is lethargy which eventually brings down the business's downfall. In the same thread, it is our view that your investing practices and models too will need to evolve over time as more information gets presented, as more trends become visible, and as you embark on a mission of continuous learning. Benford's law of controversy is not really a law, but it's more of an adage that says, passion is inversely proportional to the amount of real information available. So there are two ways of looking at it. Firstly, the theory says that the fewer facts one knows, the more interesting the topic becomes. And secondly, when one is given the opportunity to fill information gaps with rumors, theories, and imagination, people tend to cling on to what they want to be true, which more often than not is something that they are passionate about. From an investing standpoint, it is important to check the passion of the person delivering the information. Essentially, if the information is there, that is, there is reasonable amount of data, then there is little reason to argue a particular position with extreme passion. In fact, this reminds me of what the former Netscape CEO, Jim Barksfield once said, if we have data, let's look at data. But if we all have only opinions, then let's go with mine. Cope's rule postulates that species often evolve to get bigger bodies over time. And this happens for the simple reason that there are many competitive advantages to being big. 
But size also has its drawback in the form of requiring more food per unit of body mass, being unable to hide, having a slow reproductive process, etc., which can often be amongst the primary causes for their extinction. In other words, the same force that pushes you to become big can also lead to you dying or going extinct. When we connect this with investing, I'm sure we can visualize a similar life cycle for most companies and industries. So just like bigger species are better at capturing prey, can support bigger brains, and can travel longer distances, similarly, large businesses get favorable terms, the advantages of economies of scale, and a strong brand name. But having said this, everything moves in cycles, and what we are seeing now with the Indian consumer internet companies is a good example of it, with popular names like Unacademy, Blinkit, Baiju's, Ola, etc., laying off employees, reducing operations in many cities, going slow on marketing, resorting to cost-cutting exercises, etc., all in the name of trimming the fat. But come to think of it, the reason they got into this position was because they got too big. The valuations became bigger, their headcount increased rapidly, they got lots of media attention, etc., which made them grow faster than the benefits they accrued to the value chain. For investors, Scope's rule has serious implications on their wealth creation, and it's important to evaluate the stage at which the company is, that is, do they still have many years of growth within them, or are they now too big to succeed? Plainly speaking, stationarity says that the past is a statistical guide to the future, which is another way of saying that the big forces that impact a system don't change over time. For example, if you want to know how many people are going to die next year, then an examination of the last 100 years of actuarial tables should do the trick. Now, from an investing standpoint, this concept of stationarity is the bedrock principle for quant-based investment managers. I mean, at the core of every quant-based model is the assumption that there are patterns in the stock markets that have prevailed in the past, and those patterns will also prevail in the future, and this steadiness can be used to make money in the financial markets. However, as wonderful and scientific stationarity might seem, it has the tendency to work right up until the moment it does it. It's a bit like stationarity meeting a black swan event, like what we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine, or China pulling the plug on its internet companies, etc., which can come as major unfactored surprises. In fact, Scott Sagan, a professor at Stanford University, said it best when he said, things that have never happened before happen all the time. As investors, we cannot think of all such scenarios, but what is in our control is to decide beforehand what to do with our assets and allocations when the crisis happens. And if you want some help with that, then do refer to these ET Money Genius explainer videos whose link is available in the description of this video. Agronomy is nothing but the study of agriculture, and Liebig's law of the minimum says that a plant's growth is limited not by its total, but by its most scarcest nutrient. For example, if you were to give a plant everything except for nitrogen or water, then the plant is going nowhere. Likewise, if the soil has a mix of different nutrients, Liebig's law says that the crop yield will only be as good as the availability of the least abundant nutrient in the soil. This concept is highly relatable to business and investing frameworks where one bad bank or one broken supply chain can ruin an entire system's trajectory. In essence, complex systems are more fragile than what one assumes, and as an investor, it becomes all the more important to research and find where the weakest links are. Alright, so these five real-world principles are just some of the many theories and scenarios across disciplines that find their way into investing. We believe the knowledge of this can be very useful in creating strong mentals and investment models. In fact, if you get some reading time, then do try to pick a copy of these non-investing books here, which come highly recommended and is bound to elevate one's view of the world. And if you too come across such a book that dazzles you and has a strong cohesion to investing, then do let us know in the comments box below. Once again, thank you for your time, do like this video, do subscribe to our channel, and I look forward to catching up with you soon. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.